This is Growth Guide, a podcast exploring the depths of curiosity, questioning everything in the name of growth. I'm your host, Brian D'Alessandro. John Tamayo is the founder of the Atmananda Yoga Sequence and the inventor of the Atmananda Alignment Mat. It's a Hatha and Ashtanga-based yoga system. Back in 1994, after he saw many yoga students in New York City injuring themselves, he realized that it was a result of the faster-paced yoga style taking place in the West, along with many yoga styles that were paying little attention to alignment in their teachings. He created the sequence in such a way that equips yoga practitioners with the tools that they need to become more conscious about which movements may be the source of their aches and pains, and to learn how to adjust their alignment in order to prevent future injuries for a lifelong practice. I studied with John T. for my teacher training almost 10 years ago, and I'll say firsthand that no other yoga teacher I've experienced gets more quickly to the underlying issues. Living in New York City, I had the choice between a lot of incredible teachers, but for me it was a no-brainer. Breath is the backbone of his approach, and John's style demands that we take responsibility for how we show up on and off the mat. His teachings consistently move beyond the mat and into living a more consciously aligned lifestyle. John T., so happy to have you here today. Thank you for joining. Thank Um, you, Brian. Absolutely. Yeah, we haven't seen each other in quite a while since we're, uh, you know, at the hopefully the tail end of the pandemic, but um, that's created a lot of change with uh, studios and practice for yoga. You know, your program is an incredible one. Obviously, I was living in New York City and had the option to take any teacher training program that I could, and I uh, researched quite a bit. And the thing that attracted me to Atmananda yoga sequence was the intense focus on alignment and building a strong foundation. Totally, yeah, totally agree with you. I think like, because I'm seeing so many people getting hurt in the practice of yoga, um, since the very beginning I started teaching uh, 25 years ago, I noticed people that were coming to the yoga studio complaining from other teachers that they got to be pushed into positions that their bodies were not ready to get into it, or they were forced to go into a very difficult situation that were physically, mentally, or emotionally ready to get into it. I started observing that and I started realizing like, that's not, that's not what yoga is all about. I think we need to create a practice of yoga that is safe for an individual for a lifetime that you can practice when you reach your 50s. At that time, I was in my 20s. Like now I'm over 50. Mm. So, and I, and I was thinking to myself, like, I don't want to get hurt, first of all, because I don't like to go to a hospital. <laughs> mm. I don't want to get surgery and my knees or my collateral ligaments or my meniscus or my thoracic area or my lumbar area. Because a lot of teachings of, of yoga is push, push, push and going to the next level. But sometimes the students do not know how to breathe. The students do not understand symmetry or body alignment. And you cannot force a person that is not ready with the deeper understanding of alignment and technique to go into a position that the body is not going to be able to hold or sustain itself there. So I started observing that and then I started like, no, I need to develop myself more as an instructor and I need to learn more so I can really contribute back to my community in a healthy way so people can practice safely. And that's what I started doing 20 27 years ago, 28 years ago almost, is develop myself in learning technique, learning anatomy, learning alignment, learning uh, symmetry, learning breathing, learning emotional stuff so I can really contribute to my students in a different level. And it's been an amazing journey because since I've been teaching, Brian, over, over 27 years, since I've been teaching, I cannot wood, and that is, None of my students get hurt. None of them. And that is a big plus for me. That's a big success because if I can protect you from hurting yourself in the practice of yoga, then I'm potentially doing my job. You know, I want to just add on that. It's not like your um, your practices all yin where it's, you know, just so gentle and never pushing. There is pushing in there, but it's always... Oh, yeah 
pushing on top of this level of uh, the, this foundation of yes. alignment and and safety. You know, you had us in teacher training, and it's I know it's a common practice that you do. Is you had us teaching for I think two weeks where we were blindfolded, and okay. nobody got hurt. Yes, but I think like once you gave the foundation to the student. And then you let the student know how they're supposed to move and give them the space to rest, to, to allow themselves to feel what is good for them or what is not good, what is dangerous, what is not dangerous, and to have what is called Viveka in Sanskrit, it means discrimination, to have the ability to start, consolidate their bodies and how they're breathing, how they're feeling about and take a decision based on that. It gives them a lot of space and freedom to protect their bodies at the same time challenge themselves. So it's a recipe in there that is very powerful. That means, of course, that our practice, the way we practice the sequence and the way we flow every day, we sweat all the time. But it's a very conscious sweat in which we know what we're doing. We want to go deeper, but we are conscious how we get there. Another thing that really resonated with me and challenged me was you are not there to fix anybody or to do the work for them. The, the program really develops people to listen deeply. I mean, you yeah. would stand at the front of the class sometimes and you would say the same thing. Instead of going and physically adjusting someone's body to give an adjustment, you tend to give these vocal adjustments where yeah. people have to listen. They need to connect with their body and make the adjustment. And I've heard you at, at the front of the room for maybe like two minutes straight repeating the same thing, you know, like ground the back heel at a 45 degree angle, ground the back heel, and you would just keep saying it until people actually made that connection. And there's an empowerment to that where people yeah. are taking responsibility for their position on the mat and hopefully off the mat. Yeah, and I think like um, there's uh, also a, a big misunderstanding in the yoga community, and that is that most of the yoga community, people that are practicing yoga, they, a lot of them, they think that you have to go deeper into the poses, or you have to be able to do the splits, or you have to be able to do this or that, and it's not about that. But you, what you need to really emphasize is on going deeper into the breathing. That's where you really go deeper, because what happens is when you start breathing deep, you're creating inside of your body the right amount of space that you need in order for you to have more mobility. Now, if you have a space inside the body, there is better circulation. If you have a space inside the joints, there is better mobility. If there is a space inside the internal organs, there is more oxygen. If there is a space and decompression of the spinal cord, there is more spinal fluid going to the brain. So, if we have a space, we are facilitating this process for a person to not only to feel more spacious, but also to feel healthier because you're increasing circulation, you're massaging the internal organs, you're cleansing your lymphatic system, and you're bringing the spinal fluid to the brain. So all of these things contribute to the well-being of the individual. At the same time, you are going deeper, not into the pose, but with the breathing, and that makes the difference. Mm. And so you developed a sequence of poses that is designed to move through the whole body, both physically, through the organs, emotionally. Can you, can you uh, unpack that a bit? Yeah, so the, the whole entire sequence is actually composed of 71 poses. And um, these 71 poses, of course, you can do like 200, 300, 500, 1,008 poses. You know, like they are posters by um, teachers that they develop like thousand different poses. But that's not the idea. I think it's better to learn to master few and become a master of them, yeah? Because for the average person that you have to make a living, you got to work every day, you come from work very tired, but you need to cook for yourself. It's very hard for an individual to spend four, five, six hours of their time on daily basis to do 1,000 different poses. It doesn't really make sense in my consciousness. So the sequence is designed for the average person that really is working on daily basis, and they also understand that they need to exercise on daily basis. They need to oxygenate their body and keep their body healthy to overcome stress and to maintain a healthy level of living. So we create 71 poses that compose the seven group of asanas, means position, seven groups. So we have in one group, 
forward bends. And what is it that forward bends do for our body? It massages our internal organs, it, it tones the muscles in the back, and activates the whole entire nervous system. And so we have forward bends, we have back bends, we have a spinal twist, we have inversions, uh, like headstand, shoulder stand, arm balance and pose, that's what are called inversions. Then we have um, seated spinal twist, we have hand balancing poses, and we have balancing poses, things that have one leg on the floor and the other leg up. So all of these seven group of asanas work every part of your body in 50 minutes, 50 minutes a day. All you gotta do is those sequence, and that sequence work from the front to the back, from the right to the left, from the above and below, from the inside to the outside, every part of the body. Those seven group of asanas are connected to the seven wings of life, the seven breaths. So the, the wind that comes from the north, the wind that comes from the south, the wind that comes from the east and the west, the wind that comes from the above and below, and the wind that comes from within. So the seven group of asanas are composed and complementary to the seven group or seven breaths of the body. So this is all interconnected to give the student a really good class on daily basis. And then you can do this sequence until you're 100 years old. And there is no risk that you're gonna get hurt. Why? Because we're not going into very intensive lotus position because in the West, we sit down on chairs while in the east, people sit on the floor. So if you sit on the floor in the east, your hips naturally gonna be more open. So it's easy for the people on the east to bend the knees into lotus position. While here in the west, we sit on the chair, so it's gonna be more difficult for us to go into lotus position. So we don't wanna force our students to go into a lotus position when their hips are tight, because it can hurt the knees. So we need to take these things into consideration, into account, because I need your needs to be healthy so they can fulfill your basic needs of life. The need, make the basic need to walk. So if you get hurt, you're, gonna, you're not gonna be able to walk. So the idea is how can I keep you so healthy? At the same time, do your yoga practice. At the same time, we work on the hips. At the same time, you can really protect your body. Another thing I always enjoy with your uh, teaching style is as you're bringing uh, the students through the postures, you're also speaking of other deeper lessons uh, that seem to resonate more deeply when you're going through this mindful practice. Like one of them is how you do anything is how you do everything. Yes, yeah, the little things of life that sometimes we don't understand because I feel that everything is interconnected. You know, like how you feel internally is how you're gonna project externally. And how the environment is externally is going to affect you internally, yeah? So we need to take into account that we are these little cells in this physical planet of existence called the planet Earth. So I see myself like a cell in this planet and the mother is the body of this physical plane of existence called the earth. And we are these little cells. We are affected by, by the weather. We are affected by the sky. We are affected by the rain, by the snow, by the cold weather, by the sun. We are very affected. Our physical bodies are very affected by the planets, by the position of the moon, by the equinox, by the spring, by the summer, by the fall. So keeping all these little things in mind, we need to understand that the external universe is affecting my internal universe and how I feel internally is also going to be affecting my external reality, my external universe. So that's where the idea of how you do anything is how you do everything is how can you bring mindfulness and consciousness into this physical here now where you do it consciously, where if you practice in yoga, you are breathing consciously. If you move in the body, you're moving consciously. If you are answering, you are answering consciously. You're sitting, you're sitting consciously. So you are always in this state of consciousness where you continue expanding and expanding and expanding into awareness. And that's basically the idea of the practice of yoga. 
Mm. And it, it really um, expands far beyond. I mean, I know the eight limbs of yoga obviously expand beyond the physical, but you incorporate a lot of that into your courses as well. And diet and nutrition is a whole area that we uh, mm. studied as well. Um, what's your, uh, you know, what's your take there in relationship to the practice and uh, nutrition? I feel that most of the humans, a lot of humans actually, including myself in different degrees, right? Um, most of us are eating and we eat too much. And we are also eating because we are emotionally in balance. We have no balance, emotional balance. So a lot of humans are eating because they're craving potentially a lot of sugar, uh, a lot of foods that are not really the best for them, very unhealthy. And, and that is because they are emotionally out of balance. And so we're no, a lot of people are not eating because of a nutritional value. They are eating because they are emotionally out of balance. And even the student already ate, they still feel empty internally. So they're trying to eat more to try to satisfy something that cannot be satisfied. And that is because they're not fulfilled within inside, within themselves. So they feel like they're going to bring something in to see if maybe they feel full, but they're not going to feel full because they are empty. Yeah. So that's where yoga comes in, where you start really recognizing your true nature, you recognizing the self. And you, you get so deep into this process that you start recognizing the one that is recognizing itself. <laughs> it's like you're going deeper into different layers. Mm -hmm. But students need to pay a lot of attention to the diet because diet affects the way you feel and how you feel affects the way you think and how you think is going to affect the way you interact in your environment. Let me give you an example of this. A lot of our kids nowadays, they eat a lot of sugar, including in a lot of uh, schools. They provide the kids with a lot of sugar. And these sugars affect the spleen. It brings the energy up. And it prevents the kids from paying attention. So they, they become ADD, attention deficit disorder. They're not paying attention because the sugar levels are so high in their brain that they cannot be quiet because they have so much energy because of the sugar levels going too high up into the glands, in the, into the brain. So if you start learning how to balance your diet and you get the right amount of nutrition to your body, then potentially you can find your balance. Now, do not take me wrong in terms when I said the diet, that you have to be totally 100% vegan, that you have to be 100% vegetarian, and you have to be 100% pure. No. I don't I, I'm seeing this a lot, and I'm suggesting to people to eat what they feel that their body needs. They have to learn to listen to their bodies, yeah? Because what happens, let's say, for example, like a lot of people get into becoming breastarians, so breastarians I'm talking about, like people that live on air, <laughs> that I think of those. But I'm thinking about people that become vegetarians or vegans. Yeah. And a lot of them, they be actually, they prevent the body from receiving the right amounts of, of protein in their bodies. And they don't supplement the body with the right protein, the right quantity that you need, especially if you're thinking a lot. You need protein in your brain. You need B12, B6. If you don't give to the body the right amount of protein and you are vegetarian or vegan, you become what is called Carbohydratarian, you start craving a lot of carbohydrates. Why? Because you're not giving the body the right amount of protein. And then you just walk around trying to eat, to eat, to eat, to try to give the body protein, but you cannot get it. So what I'm suggesting to my students is moderation with everything. You know, like if you eat fish, do it consciously. Don't eat it every day. Yeah. And if you are going to eat your fish, try to select a type of fish that cannot be cultivated. Yeah? Or try to eat a fish that doesn't have so much uh, poison in it. There's mm -hmm. something like tuna. It's a great taste, but it has a lot of mercury. Or let's say, for example, tilapia. 
is what you buy outside in most of the restaurants. They give you tilapia, but it has a lot of mercury. But if you're gonna eat fish, maybe be selective, maybe, maybe get a uh, wild salmon, which is still wild and it's still natural, or maybe get um, a porgy, which cannot be cultivated, yeah? So you need to start becoming more, more aware of what is it that you are putting in your body and how this particular food is going to affect the way you feel internally. And the other thing you need to question yourself, is, like, I'm gonna eat this, because I feel emotionally out of balance, or I'm gonna eat this because it's giving me nutritional value so I can really feel healthier because I'm bringing chlorophyll into my body. And what is it what is it that chlorophyll is? Chlorophyll is actually amazing amounts of energy, uh, oxygen into your body, into your gut, intestine. So that's very powerful. So we need to integrate into our diet more greens, healthy greens. And now the other thing is like, a lot of people like, oh, I'm gonna eat only salads. Salads might not be really good for you neither. You can actually get sick eating the salads, why? Let's say something like if you are very mental and you're thinking a lot and you're not grounded and your digestion is very slow and you start eating a lot of salads which have a lot of ether and you have a lot of amounts of ether inside the body but you have also a lot of ether because you're thinking too much in your brain. That's going to create an imbalance. First of all, you think a lot. Then you put a lot of ether in your body, which is come through the salads because of the ether, greens, a lot of ether. But at the same time, you're vegan and you're not eating any protein. And so, and your digestion is slow because you're not exercising. That's going to create an imbalance. Mm. So salads is not the best for everybody. You need to have a balance. You need to have moderation with everything that you eat. So salads are really healthy. Protein is also very healthy. Soups and root, fruit, root vegetables are really healthy. You need to have a balance and you need to understand how to create this balance. Yeah, and I'm hearing this correlation between your approach of how you develop the Atmananda sequence of as above, so below, or you know what's happening externally is happening internally. And this, um, this cultivation of... Um, listening and and understanding when your body is asking for something it might be seasonally because yes. we're going into you know we're coming out of winter and so then you start craving some very different flavors and you know foods um because your body needs those or it might be that your body is going through something emotionally or physically and it's it's asking for something else and that notion of listening to what it's asking for and and being in dialogue with your own body Totally, totally, and I, and I think let's also like like a lot of people are very busy. Uh, a lot of people are very busy thinking about what they want, but they're not questioning what is it that they want and why. They're not checking within themselves what is it that they want. Let's also like if I go to a restaurant and let's also example like we are in uh, winter time here in the United States, and I see in a restaurant asparagus. Right, that sounds, sounds really good. And I potentially will go for the asparagus, but because I don't understand, I say, oh yeah, I want asparagus. Sounds good, like saute asparagus, whatever. That's great. But when, when you start really paying attention and you become really present and you start questioning, like, wait a minute, I live in New York. I live in an environment where there is no asparagus in New York City. So where does asparagus come from? And then I start doing the research and then I ask potentially, the owner or whatever, where the asparagus came, oh, they come from Peru. Do you have any idea how long it takes for an asparagus, a portion of asparagus in your plate to come from Peru? So they've been cut already for like maybe a couple, three months, two, three months, five months. They've been cut and they bring it to your plate. So there is no life force in this asparagus. And that's why it's very important to eat local. Why? Because the local food can give you the energy that you need in your environment. So if there is winter time, don't crave foods from other countries. Try to stay here local. Not only that you're supporting the local farmers, but also you are supporting your body because you are bringing into your intestines, into the small large intestine where you have your neural response, the healthy bacteria that you need according to your environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, we need to understand where the food comes from. Let's not say like, um, I will not eat uh, tilapia because it's cultivated in a pond. And, and so it's unhealthy, you know what I mean? So I try to avoid as much as possible the tilapia. But if I go to a restaurant where they have potentially wild salmon, I will go for the wild salmon because it's natural, it's organic, and it cannot be cultivated, and it's not GMO, genetically modified. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that we need to learn to understand how to balance. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, it's definitely harder if you're living in a city. I mean, I lived in Manhattan for about 20 years, and yeah. uh, you definitely find yourself getting disconnected from that natural world. And so that's one of the things I think is really important is that we find ways to stay in touch with that. That could be monitoring the cycle of the moons. It could be planting, you know, some herbs and plants in, indoors so that you're at least connected to that or joining a CSA where you're getting seasonal fruits and vegetables and totally. reconnecting to what the natural rhythms are. Yeah. And um, now the system is trying to, unfortunately, trying to disconnect us. That's, that's, that's the issue, and that's why things like this can help the community to keep, in, keep us together so we can at least try to, to elongate this process so we're not getting disconnected so fast. You know? like, and, I, and I feel like really sad for future generations where a lot of the kids, they're going to be eating literally genetically modified food all the time with non-nutritional value in it, you know, and, and this is what, where you and I, individuals, and have a little bit of an awareness, just a little bit, and how can we contribute to the community by education and letting people know of the importance of the right amount of food, where the food comes from, how we can support our local uh, farmers market, and how can we support our organic market. And how can we really be more conscious in the way we consume things? Because it's affecting our environment and our bodies. One of the things I've noticed with, um, you know, younger kids is they're still tapped in, even if they have been eating denatured foods, they're tapped into their sense of feeling. And when you introduce them to a food that is nutrient rich, they respond to it and, yeah. and feel the aliveness of it. So okay. just, just sharing that and, and starting that dialogue, because I know my wife and I have these conversations with different parents and, you know, who are on different parts of the spectrum of, of connection or disconnection with their food. And when people, um, start to to hear about it and learn about it in a loving way they're they're usually pretty receptive totally. um, so uh, i want to shift gears and go towards um another part of what you've developed that i absolutely love and and really changed my yoga practice for for the better um, and that's the patented yoga mat that you designed when did you design that and just yeah let's let's hear about that because it's really incredible yeah, actually, the, the design of the mat came out of necessity because I, I was teaching a lot of private yoga classes. And, you know, the way we used to teach many years ago, it was all done in a flat mat, but there was no lines in the mat to give an understanding to the students uh, how to place their feet, how to place their hands, how to open their fingers, what is the distance between the hands and the feet, what is symmetrically, how they're supposed to feel. And... At the time, I was teaching a lot of privates, and I realized I was teaching like five, six privates a day. And then I was going up and down trying to accommodate a student's back foot at 45 degrees. And I, and I started getting tired, you know, like when you're teaching like four, five, six privates a day for a few years, they start feeling like, shit, this is getting too much. Hmm. And then I started like, oh. And then I came up with this idea. And it's like, and then I started like, oh, what if I just put with a marker lines so i don't have to go up and down and then i start making putting lines in the mat and then i start creating what is called the middle line and then i start putting cross lines across the mat and then i start putting 45 degree lines and then i start realizing that when i was teaching i would just tell the student place the back foot on top of the 45 degree so the student instead of keeping the foot flat they will put it at a 45 degree angle and then I realized I didn't have to go down anymore. And then it was just a verbal communication, and the student visually can see how to place the foot. And then I realized, oh, my God, this is an amazing idea. And then so 
I start marking these maps, and then I start realizing that a lot of my privates, they will just come back and recommend more people to come and take more privates. And then I start doing workshops and teaching people how to align their body. And then I catch myself in Orlando, Florida. One of my colleagues that opened a yoga studio there called Killing House. Uh, she's a psychiatrist, a, a, a psychologist. And she's like, John T, you need to come and share your idea of the map with my students. And I'm like, okay, I go. And then I catch myself there. And I had like maybe 70 students taking the workshop. And then everybody was making a line to have their lines made according to their body height. And I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be too many lines. <laughs> so like, I'm not going to be able to teach the workshop. And then I was like, I need to do something about it. And then the amazing idea, one of my, my students actually, Claudine is her name. She says, John T, why don't you just patent and do the lines in a factory where they move the mats, they make the mats according to your height, and then they put the lines on a machine. I was like, that's an amazing idea. And so, so then she helped me with all this amazing process. And then we started literally creating the mat. We, we had to create minimum 500 units so people can really buy a small, medium, or large size mat. And the different sizes are based on the proportions, right? I mean, that's what I love is that it's kind of like the yoga matrix. You're, you're plotting out the, the different um, lines that you move through, through these postures. And for me, I'm a visual learner as well. So being able to visually see where I'm supposed to be, it's such a, a different approach because typically in yoga, what I've experienced is you're adjusted for being out of alignment when you do it in a class. Sometimes, I mean, a teacher usually has, you know, 10, 20 students in there and she may or, may or he may not get to you. But with the mat, it's giving you this frame of reference for your alignment and you develop the vocabulary so you know how to go in the poses before you come out of alignment. Totally. And, 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 and believe it or not, um, like, you know, like um, right in March, uh, February, March of 2020, last year, where we're going to be closed for because of the COVID coronavirus. I was like, I always teach on, um, I never taught in line, but then I was forced to teach online. You know, like literally, like I need to teach online because I have all these students. And now I realize, oh, my God, this is amazing. Because it makes my life so easy to teach online. Like this morning, I was teaching uh, people in China, and I was doing the yoga training this morning. And it was so easy to tell the person, please move the back foot on the top of the 45-degree line. Mm. So it's so easy. Or move the toes on top of the second line. It was so easy because then you can give verbal communication in a way that the student visually can see what you mean. So there is a common ground of understanding between what you are saying and what the student is seeing. So when you say the word 45 degree and a student see 45 degree, then they match. And then the student can move the back foot on 45 degrees. So the alignment of the student's body is in the right location to protect them and at the same time to fuel the practice. Yeah, it definitely gave me so much more confidence in my practice. Um, you know, any of that not knowing of if I was doing it right, if I could go deeper or would I hurt. Now uh, I, I know if I'm standing in a position of, of foundation and, and strength, I could move deeper and my body is going to tell me if I can go further, but I'm not going to injure it as a result. Yes. It protects your body totally, yes. Really amazing. I mean, I think it's uh, such a such an incredible innovation. Totally, it's it's been amazing, and uh, we actually patented, and now we are licensing it to different companies. Um, and we have people in Colombia, in in uh, Chile, uh, in Germany. We have people in Dubai. We have people in China. They are all using the mat according to their body height because it's like a customized mat. Let's say so the way we function. We have. Four different sizes. We have a small mat, which is people that are less than five two tall. Then we have people that are between five two to five six. We give them what is called the medium size mat. Then we have people that are taller than five six. Then we give them a large size mat. When I go to London and teach in London, or I teach in Denmark or Germany, people are very tall, so we need to bring extra large mat. So there are four different sizes: a small, medium, large, and extra large. And the mat fit 
according to your body height. Since I came up with the idea uh, about altogether like about 14, 15 years ago, wow, it's been an amazing journey actually. Uh, a lot of companies are now using the lines, a lot of studios are using the mat, and now actually China is interested in, in using the mats, and that's what I was training them this morning, how to use the mat. So cool. Yeah, you've really been on this uh, yoga journey for a long time. What are some of the changes and evolutions you've seen in how people practice yoga or, or any of that? I think like, like, personally for me, when I see a student feeling at peace with themselves, I think that's been very beautiful. For me, for the last 27 years of teaching is to bring inner peace to a student's mind. I, I, and also, overall, I start seeing them feeling healthier, like feeling happier, smiling more. So for me, when I see students, like really kind of like low in energy, tight, tense, worry, anxious, and kind of like sick, and no energy at all, like kind of depressed, and then practicing yoga for like two, three, five months, and then you see them like really energized, standing tall, feeling present, very receptive, very willing to learn and, and willing to experience life and feeling full of life force. That's been beautiful for me. I think, I, I think if I can see the students smiling and having fun and enjoying themselves as they go through this journey of yoga, I think I'm doing my job, seeing them more happy. Yeah, I think a lot of us uh, come to, to yoga as a physical practice, but uh, quickly learn that there's so much more going on underneath uh, with the yeah, emotional yeah. body. You also focus a lot on the um, vagus nerve, the um, nervous system, the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. Um, why is that so important? Because most people do not understand that the way we breathe and the way we move affect the way we feel. So once the students start understanding that the breath is affecting your internal organs and the internal organs are affecting your emotional body or your emotional body is affecting your physical body. Once the students start understanding this, they become more conscious about what they are doing. So every time we make a move in the practice of yoga, we are affecting our nervous system. Uh, every time we are working on the flow of the vinyasa flow, we are strengthening the core muscles. Every time we're doing forward bend, we're turning the muscles in the back and we're stretching the whole entire nervous system. So we are eliminating stress and tension. So all these movements affect the way we feel and the breathing is affecting the way we're thinking. So the breath affects the way we move the body. What does that mean? The way an individual moves the body is in a total expression of the way they are thinking. How you move is how you think. So when you see students that they are moving too much, they're not still, they're like anxious, that's called anxiety. So you already know that the student is here and they're totally anxious. You already know that the student has an imbalance, a mental, a, 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 a mental imbalance that is connected with the breathing imbalance. So you observe that, and then you start sharing information with the student, and then you start telling them how to breathe, how deep to breathe, how long to breathe, and how long to exhale. Then you start giving them an understanding of the importance of the inhalation and the exhalation and the retention of the air inside the body or the retention of the air outside the body. So they can affect the sympathetic or parasympathetic system based on the inhalation or the exhalation. What does that mean? For example, most of physical bodies nowadays, they are suffering from inflammation. There is a lot of inflammation on the physical body because of the diet, lack of exercise, and way of thinking. Because our thoughts also affect the way we feel. Every time we think negative, we release chemicals in our body called peptides, and these peptides affect the way we feel inside the body. So, but, stay with me, if you exhale longer, let's for example, like your inhalation is from one to four, and you exhale from one to four, you're not exhaling longer enough. So you're not releasing what is called the carbon dioxide out of the body. But if your inhalation is from one to four, and you make a conscious effort 
to exhale longer, let's for example, from one to eight. In that moment that you exhale from one to eight, what you're doing is you're releasing the intercostal muscles, you're releasing the tension in the diaphragm, then pressing the nerve in the vagus nerve, in the spinal cord, in the nervous system, and you're releasing that tension so the vagus nerve can be active and activate what is called the white blood cells in the body. What is it that the white blood cells do for your body in terms of health? It increases your immune system. So it releases inflammation from the body because just the longer exhalation. So if the student do not understand the importance of the breath, they will have a lot of inflammation. If the student understand how important is the breath, they will release inflammation. So this is all knowledge. And this is information that students do not know. So breathing deeper and exhale twice longer release inflammation. And this is a, there, is, there is a problem in the United States and all around the world that the students' joints are very tight. There's a lot of calcification in the joints. There is a lot of calcium accumulating in the joints because of lack of mobility. And all of this, let's say, like, too much calcium in the joints creates inflammation. People call it arthritis. So anything that finishes in ISIS means inflammation. Arthritis, gastritis, yeah, sinusitis, all of these inflammation of the sinus here. Gastritis, gastrointestinal tract inflammation, colitis, inflammation of the colon, yeah? All of these things is inflammation. We need to understand how to fight inflammation in the body through the practice of yoga, through the longer exhalation. This is, this is very important. If you wanna get healthier, you need to make changes in your personal life, but if you want your life to change, you need to start making changes in your life. <laughs> There's another one of the John T. <laughs> gems. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Have you noticed, uh, you, you work with um, folks in a lot of different countries. Have you noticed any um, overarching um, differences between, say, connection to breath in the U.S. versus in China or Japan or the U.K.? Yes. And it's, I think it's all very uh, organic because I meet people in, in everywhere and some people are very present, very grounded, very aware, and very healthy. And then I start talking to them, and I start asking basic questions. Oh, what do you do? Do, 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 do? What type of food that you eat? How long have you been practicing? Do you meditate? Blah, blah, blah. And then I start noticing that a lot of the people that are really loving, caring, present, very loving, and very healthy, and very aware, very present, very here now, are usually people that are more conscious of the way they're breathing, the way their diet, the lifestyle, their environment, their exercise on daily basis, the meditation practice. And then I start meeting people all around the world, I can go anywhere. And then I was like, oh, what have you been doing? Do you meditate? Oh, no, I don't meditate. Do you eat healthy? No, I don't eat, I eat whatever, you know? So they're not very conscious. And then you start realizing that they actually have a lot of different type of issues that are very easy to solve. But that's because of lack of knowledge and information. So it's very general. I think it's, it's very hard to tell that this country is healthier than this other country or this country is less healthier than this other country. I think it's an individual process. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there's also this mindset a lot of times of, um, you know, either how we're consuming information and consuming too much and, and just overwhelmed um, to where with things like um, our practice or our diet or our meditation, whatever it is, um, we say, oh, I can't even think about it, you know, and, and I, I, so, so they outsource it. They either look for someone else to tell them exactly what to do, or yeah. they avoid it altogether. And totally. when you're looking for someone to tell you what to do, there's a disconnection oftentimes with your body's needs. And yeah. so this notion of how can I listen to what my body needs, whether it be my physical, mental, or emotional body, it yeah. actually frees up res resources from the mental space. When you're saying I don't have space for it, you don't need it. Because when you're listening, it's more about the feeling. And all of a sudden, it happens automatically in a very subtle way. Yes. I, I, I think like um, we need to learn to listen to our bodies. And the less you do, the better. So, and so for us as humans, we had this tendency to become what is called a spiritual tourist. So 
we go here, we go there, we go everywhere, we're searching for something that cannot be found. And so what we do is we go everywhere to realize that it's not there. <laughs> so we are looking for a place that is not a place. We are looking for something that cannot be seen. Uh, we're trying to obtain something that cannot be obtained. And we are, we are, we are searching for something that cannot be found. And eventually we get tired and we reach the we reach a point in our process of searching where we just get tired and you just surrender. Just like, oh, I'm so tired of searching everywhere in the world and I'm not finding, I haven't been able to find what I'm looking for. And then when you stop, you realize that you are what you're looking for. <laughs> mm. And and we we refer to it as settling down in life, exactly, right? Yes. As you get older, you start to settle down. But this idea of growing roots, because I've seen this over the past 10 years, grow more prevalent where people are generally very comfortable with the superficial aspect of it skate yeah. around on the surface i could have these experiences but do i integrate them into my day-to-day -day? do i actually grow roots into a community or a practice yeah. where it creates accountability it requires yeah. discipline and all of a sudden those things um create this vulnerability and this awareness that allows you to grow much deeper inwards and outwards. Whereas, you know, it's, it's, it's very similar to what we see in social media. It's very easy to be focused on what everybody's doing, making things look so good, counting how many likes I'm getting versus yeah. having deep, meaningful experience, whether they're virtual or in person. Totally. I, and and I, that, that's a really good point. I think that personally, we need to have a little bit of more self-discipline, I mean, self-love. And now a lot of people don't love themselves, so they don't have any discipline. So they, mm. they're very distracted all the time. And what social media is doing nowadays, unfortunately, we need to learn to use technology. We cannot allow technology to use us. So what social media is doing is it's creating a tremendous amount of distraction for people from stopping and going inward and really see what's going on internally and, and start paying attention to things that really matters the most. So, but unfortunately nowadays, everything is available on the internet and you can really see it, you can really have an understanding, but you're not allowing yourself to process the information so you can feel what it that mean. You know, like everybody has the best answers to everything, but they cannot do it themselves. So what I'm trying to say is like, do not offer something that you don't have. And, mm. and, and that's what social media is doing for us. It's offering us all these things. It's offering us happiness. It's offering us financial freedom. It's offering us this and this and that, all these little things. But if you don't have it within yourself, you're not going to be able to really share. So do not demand from other people something that you cannot offer. Mm. Yeah, you know, it, it also feels a lot like this digital buffet. Yes. You can go there at any time. You could fill your plate up as much as you want. You're not, you know, you're not considering the quality of the intake, right? When you go to a buffet, yes. it's usually not great quality food. You're eating more than you could possibly digest totally. and, and absorb as nutrients. And so, yeah. you know, it's fine. Go to a buffet once in a while, but yeah. don't make that your habitual act of going there every single day the second you have a free moment, because then you're over consuming and what you're taking in is um, quantity over quality. Totally. And, and, and even if you do it, I think like based on my experience, it's something interesting and in that is like, even if you go to the buffet and you're eating more than what your body can tell you to eat, like logically, right? But if you do it with awareness, awareness will be enough. It's like, sort of like people that like to smoke or people that are addicted to caffeine or people that are addicted to different types of things. I think based on my experience and observation is if you do this thing with a lot of awareness and you consciously do it with so much awareness, I think awareness is enough. Mm. Because once you become aware of something, you're no longer doing it. The issue is that we are unconscious. So we repeat it again and again because we are functioning on autopilot. 
with not understanding what we are doing. Let me give you an example of this. If, if you have a friend that likes to smoke and is smoking all the time and you tell them, you know what, smoking is not that good for your lungs. And the person says, yes, I know, I know. But they continue doing it. That means they don't know. Why? If you say you know and you don't do, then you don't know. But if you say, I know, and you do, then you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, and this also reminds me, I have a friend who is a meditation teacher and, um, I, you know, used to go to his meditations quite a bit. And one day he's like, oh, yeah, let's let's go out. Let's get a beer and do a beer meditation. Mm. I was like, wait, what? I, I was, <laughs> first of all, I was surprised he would even drink. Right. I, I just had yeah. this idea that, oh, he's, a, you know, he's a shaved head, looks like a monk, like meditation teacher. He's not going to do that. But we went to a beer hall and we had this meditation around just being present with drinking yeah. this beer the whole time. And it changed the relationship to it completely. We weren't sitting there just blindly drinking and, you know, ordering more and more drinks. We were really present for it and experienced it on this whole other level. So that resonated. Totally. And it makes a huge difference when you do it with awareness and you're really present and you're very conscious. You actually enjoy the process, but you no longer function in an autopilot response where you are unconscious of what you are doing. So the idea, the way I see it, Brian, is, is, is that don't let yourself be limited by anything. Make yourself available to experience life to the fullest. Don't think that you are like this or you are like that. Don't let anything qualify you or classify you or, or put you in a particular space and a little cubicle where this is how I am and this is where I am. You know, it's not about that. It's about you being, becoming dynamic and allow yourself to flow with the rivers of life, with the flow of life, with the wind. And most of us, sometimes we resist this wind. We like, let's for example, like, let's say, are you very hungry? That you're very Italian, and you might say, I'm not going to eat. But naturally, we want to survive as a human species. You might have to eat meat, and that's okay. But you don't have to feel bad about it. But of course, if you have the options, you can choose to eat greens. Like, if I go to a buffet, as you were saying before, of course there is meat, there is chicken, there is fish, there is salad, there is vegetable, there is cooked vegetables, there is all this healthy stuff. My eyes go to the greens. I go for the greens because I, I already know how powerful the greens are in my body. And I want more oxygen in my body. And potentially I will put a protein if I feel and see that it's healthy and I look good and clean and, and energized. But I'm not just going to go for things that I know that are not going to be the best for me. So you start using what is called uh, your critical thinking. It's called Viveka. Viveka means you start having what is called discrimination. You start selecting the things that you want. And based on that selection with awareness, give you a result in your physical body about the way you feel in present time. But if I go to the buffet and I see the cake and I see the, 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 the sugar and I just go for the sugar and the carbohydrates and the bread and this, this, this and that, of course, an hour later, I'm going to feel heavy, dense, and, and lethargic, and no energy, and no creativity. I just want to fall asleep. Yeah? But mm -hmm. if I go for healthy things that are greens, I'm going to feel more energized, and I'm going to have more energy to function, and potentially I'm going to be more creative, and I'm going to be more innovative. Mm -hmm. So that makes a difference. And that's why yoga comes in, where it gives you the ability to purify your five senses so you can use your five senses so you can survive better as an individual, so you can interact with your environment in ways that are healthy for your environment, for you, for your life, as, a, as surviving as a human species. So that's where yoga comes in. John Tamayo, thank you so much for taking your time today to share you your, uh, your journey and knowledge with us. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us this week on Growth Guide. A big thanks to our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Project New You. I'm a huge fan of their nootropic brain supplement. It's helped me to develop laser focus, a better memory recall, and motivation. Nitrovit has helped me in launching this podcast amongst completing many other projects. 
Visit growthguide.love forward slash focus to learn more and use promo code GROWTH for 15% off. Make sure to visit our website, growthguide.love, where you can find freebies, exclusive content, and subscribe to the show so you'll never miss an episode. If you found value in listening, I'd really appreciate a rating on iTunes. I can't tell you just how important this is. Or spread the love. Tell your friends, your fam, heck, tell your spirit animals. And follow me on Instagram at growthguide.love. Be sure to tune in next week for our newest episode.